Please, and I'd like to invite to the podium Gavin Christie, Division Manager, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. <clears throat> he will also present on behalf of Todd Turner, Assistant Regional Director, Aquatic Resources Program of Region 3 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who has taken ill and unfortunately can't uh, join us today. So uh, with that, we'll invite Gavin to the stage and he'll discuss efforts taken by Canada and the United States to prevent the introduction and minimize risk of aquatic invasive species to the Great Lakes, including the establishment of an early detection and rapid response initiative. Gavin. Yeah, that, that, that's a little practice. I'll be doing that now as we go. Um, my friend Todd wanted to pass on his uh, uh, um, uh, sadness for not being able to be here and to be talking to us today, uh, 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 to all of you, and to be sharing this time that I have to tell you about the Aquatic Invasive Species Annex. Um, Todd wanted to be sure that I told you that it was not because he uh, was worried about coming and speaking Canadian to us, because he has that process thing all down. When uh, we learned that, that Todd was unable to come um, yesterday, um, uh, my friend Charlie Woolley of the service offered to, to uh, speak on his, in his behalf or his place. And then I, we shared the work that Todd and I had put together and the volume of material, and, and uh, Charlie and I agreed that he, he does not speak fast enough. Uh, so so uh, hang on, and, and we'll get this uh, process underway. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here and, and have a, a, a really... Uh, I'm in a good position because we have spoken a lot about aquatic invasive species during the last few days. On Monday, we spent a whole day, some of us that were here, with the Asian Carp Public Forum in which much of the message was brought forward. But I also have a real challenge, and a challenge that we've heard on a number of occasions, and that's this one. I want to tell you about some really significant successes. But I need to tell you also that we have much to do and that the battle is not won. We're in a position where that mixed message is something that is really tough to put together, but I hope that we can sort of convey that to you. So let's get going. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about, about uh, step back a bit and look at, the, uh, look at history of aquatic invasive species. We're going to talk a bit about how it is we understand the risk of species and pathways. We're going to tell a little bit about how we're working to prevent future invasions about the successes that I mentioned, and uh, what's next in our priorities of science and actions. <coughs> Firstly, and most importantly, um, this work is very much the work of a, of a broad uh, 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 group of, of federal, uh, state, provincial, uh, tribal, First Nation, and uh, uh, non-government uh, organizations that have really worked together and historically and continue to in, uh, on this, this effort overall. We're fueled, as, as all programs are, by resources, and those resources come on the U.S. side through really important uh, um, um, allocations to federal agency budgets and uh, through the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative. And here in Canada, uh, the investment in the Asian CARP program has been a, a core piece, and we'll be speaking more about those, those programs as we go. So first, a little bit of history. Um, we know this history well, and those of us on the Great Lakes know it well, that, that uh, aquatic invasive species have had a devastating uh, impact on, on ecosystems. We have invaders in the systems over the last century that have caused, uh, that, that caused direct uh, effect killing valued fishes, that disrupt and re-engineer uh, uh, food webs, that, dis that disrupt habitat, that reduce biodiversity, and that damage uh, value fisheries, infrastructure, and benefits official uses across the Great Lakes. Some of them we see here, of course, uh, the history of uh, through the canals of alewife, for example, uh, that in the 60s piled up on our beaches and plugged our, our, our water intakes. The sea lamprey, a most famous invader, directly killing uh, fishes with that amazing rasping tongue, and, and, uh, um, and we see some of the wounds created there. In the 1980s, we saw uh, uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels enter the system. And those have, of course, had the amazing impacts on the system. With them came uh, uh, gobies, a fish that has greatly affected the food web, and uh, new zooplankton, which have changed the way that the food web works. So we see the effects, amazing direct effects, like the uh, native mussel being smothered by zebra mussels in the, in the bottom of the, of the picture. And these same organisms that have entered the system are actually implicated in some of those changes that we've seen and heard about in the nutrients annex, for example. 
we saw this picture yesterday in the state of the, of the Great Lakes, this image of the number of established uh, non-native uh, species over time. And you can see we stretch back um, uh, into the 1800s. It's an amazing story of, a, of, a, of uh, uh, many species, many invaders coming through many pathways. And you can see those pathways um, uh, from live wells of boats to uh, bait release through aquaria down to shipping. And you can see that shipping was a major uh, cause of, of invasive species. And look at that rate, an increasing rate through the last 40 years. In that period, we were seeing as many as a one invader every eight months entering the system. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 2012, had a, uh, um, the drafters created a brand new annex focused on aquatic invasive species, uh, bringing a new focus on this long-standing problem and challenge. It included new commitments and new ob objectives for aquatic invasive species, and the purpose of the annex was to prevent the introduction of aquatic invasive species, to control or reduce the spread of those species, and to eradicate, where feasible, existing aquatic invasive species. There are a number of specific commitments. The first one I share with my colleagues in Annex 5, and Chris and Lauren will be speaking to you about ballast water and, and uh, modifications and, and prevention of invasives through ballast waters. We also have commitments to do risk assessments, to understand the, the risk caused by species and pathways, to establish an early detection and rapid response framework, and to take action to prevent invasion and spread through the establishment of regulation and taking actions. And of course, also to do science, to develop new tools uh, to take on those aquatic invasive species. So a lot of our work has focused on, and there's much effort, on understanding the risks of species and pathways. So let's take a look at that. To understand which species are, the, are going to cause us real trouble, we need to understand whether they can arrive, survive, reproduce in the Great Lakes, and if they get here, and will they spread, and of course, what harm will they cause? So we do that by understanding the organisms, their biology and their home locations, and then how, those, how that ecology and biology relates to our environment. And with that can help us understand the risks they pose. In the top map on the right, you can see that the silver carp species basically can fit almost anywhere in, in red there, which is all of North America, essentially. We bring that information together, our predictions, in, in, with figures and thinking in the graph below, where we look at the uh, probability of establishment or introduction against what are the consequences, and in that way map out and, and can see the, the, the uh, uh, make predictions essentially then about what the future of such organisms would have. In this case, uh, bighead and silver carp, two of the Asian carp species, and you can see that in, in lakes uh, uh, Huron, Michigan, and Erie, they're extremely uh, risky to the Great Lakes. So I mentioned the big hit carps, and we completed those risk assessments uh, um, a, a number of years ago. We have important efforts on other species underway. Right now, large binational uh, risk assessments underway on, on two more uh, Asian carp species, the grass carp and black carp, also threatening us uh, here in the Great Lakes. And then we've pulled across and looked across a broad range of species to identify what are the highest risk species to us all. The, uh, premiers, uh, the governors and premiers uh, 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 group has, uh, in its AIS task force, has established a, a, a least wanted 16 list of which uh, identifies those key, some of those key species. Here, for example, the uh, snakehead, uh, the killer shrimp, and water chestnut identified as, as organisms which are going to cause great important harm. Just as it's important to identify what are the target species that we need to look out for, we also need to understand um, um, which species, in fact, are going to be, you know, perhaps of less risk. And so we can map in the same way, uh, take a look at those. And um, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has established a screening tool to do just that and carried out 180 uh, screening activities. For example, the, the colorful Siamese fighting fish that we know from aquaria trade here, of course, it we found to be of low risk because it's unlikely to be able to survive here in the Great Lakes. Once we understand which species we're after, we need to understand what pathways are going to pose the most work so we can focus on those. One of the largest efforts to understand pathways is the, has been the uh, uh, Great Lakes, Mississippi, and Mississippi River Interbasin Study carried out and led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
It's a fantastic study in its scope, uh, looking at all of the connections between the Mississippi River and the, and, uh, and the Great Lakes Basin to understand the places and intersections where aquatic invasive species could move between them. Importantly, move in both ways, because organisms in the Great Lakes, of course, would threaten the Mississippi River if that were the case. So I've identified a series of, 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 of spots, including uh, some of the intersections of the Maumee River, for example, and the, and the Ohio Basin in, in Eagle Marsh, and actions have already been taken to block off those spots. But most importantly, of course, we identify the Chicago area waterway system and its direct connection between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River as the highest risk uh, location for the movement of those animals. And Asian carp, of course, being in the St. Mary's, or in the uh, um, uh, Illinois River, uh, causes us to really look at that threat. Well, risk assessment like this can be, we can dig in further and understand further about, the, about those work. In the Chicago area waterway, through the leadership of the U.S. Army Corps and, and the state of Illinois federal partners, there's an important uh, uh, electrical dispersion barrier in place. Now we need to understand how well it's working and if there's further risk. And in the barrier, uh, we've carried out specific studies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has led specific studies to sort of look at that issue. Using surrogate fishes have found we, found, we had the observation, I should say, that there were some Asian carps of smaller size further up the river than we had expected. So I carried out careful studies using surrogate species, golden china in this case, and found that they could actually get in between the, the uh, uh, barges and get moved some miles up the, up the, fish, up the uh, canal. So there are already ideas in place to tackle that problem, but it's an important area of risk where we're drilling into that risk assessment essentially. Illegal trade and the internet trade are other pathways that we're concerned about. We've uh, carried out work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's Great Lakes Law Enforcement uh, uh, Committee to talk to all of the uh, law enforcement agencies around the basin to inquire with them around where they saw the greatest risk of illegal activities. And here we've mapped those risks on the top graph as a relative risk scale. And you can see that, that uh, uh, pond culture and, and movement of fishes in ponds and live bait are highest ranked risks in this case. And there are a number of other ones of, of issues. We also um, uh, see important work by the Great Lakes Commission to help us understand the uh, impacts of internet trade with a new tool they've developed called the Great Lakes Detector of Invasive Aquatics in Trade. This new tool uses a web, crawl a web crawler. <laughs> now, if I was as young as Cam Davis, I'd probably know what that is. I have no idea. But it sounds very, very cool. And I do know that it, what it has done is really set up a tool that's available to, to management and others to, to help them uh, understand and explore uh, organisms moving uh, through the internet where you, of course, you can buy anything that you want. Um, on the Canadian side, we carried out a large scale uh, investigation of the risks of, of shipping including a full binational ex exploration of, of the Great Lakes. And that, uh, that work, uh, uh, published in 2014, identified the risks of, uh, to the Great Lakes. It identified the successes of the current ballast water exchange uh, work and effort. It identified the need for treatment plus that, that exchange to reduce risk. And it also identified the risk of, of movement of, a, of aquatic invasive species in the ballast water of, of Great Lakes uh, freighters moving just within the basin. We've also carried out a national risk assessment on the Canadian side, which uses, looks at the entirety of the Great Lakes on recreational boating and uh, the movement of, and the potential movement of, of organisms by recreational boating. In the, oops, in the, uh, um, here's the uh, picture, image of the, of the ports that were examined in the, in the, in the shipping assessment. And the recreational boating assessment down in the bottom right-hand side, in the small figures, you can see the kind of, of modeling that was involved there, where, where, where we set up a model where you could actually see if, a, if for example, in this case, a, an organism were to be, occur in Ludington, how quickly it would move uh, just by movement of, of, of recreational boats around the basin. That effort, and, um, and others have guided the, uh, the U.S. federal government to work with, with boating manufacturers on developing aquatic invasive species safe boats where, where the, uh, uh, say, the uh, uh, water handling systems in those would be less, less prone to invasive species. So, of course, then our next focus, and the major focus, is the prevention of spread, um, where prevention is key, of course. So our first order there, as directed, is to set up that second line of defense to determine, to set up uh, early detection and rapid response frameworks to be able to, to respond, to find and respond to new invaders. We've made really significant uh, uh, progress in this regard. Identifying the key species in Canada, Asian carps, in, um, in the United States, Asian carps and, and other uh, fishes and benthic organisms. 
We identified the key locations of highest risk through our risk assessments uh, for um, um, the uh, species to occur, or that where they might occur or enter, and then where we might find them based on, the, on, on those risk assessments. And here you can see in the map the survey sites in the United States and in Canada carried out under these two programs. So we tackled the program, with, uh, the, the study using traditional gears in this case, netting gears to capture, capture those fishes, focused on those fishes. Asian carps, it turned out, are hard to catch. And so we have to use a series of, of techniques and a whole bunch of those, of, of those techniques in combination to find them. Here you can see netting being carried out, electrofishing at the top where you use electricity to sample, and then larval fish nets that catch the fish when they're, when they're young in the system. In Lake Superior, our efforts are enhanced by, by a, a whole lake effort there where the province of Ontario and state uh, 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 groups are also looking at, at uh, identifying invasive species there. We've literally carried out thousands and thousands of samples uh, here in this, in this process. We also use new tools to help in, uh, in, enhance those techniques. Tools that have really only come into being in the last, in the last 10 and 5 years are pulled into full, in, into full process using environmental DNA to look in the water for fragments of DNA shed by organisms to see if we can find them, in this case Asian carp species. Here you can see the sample sites for, for eDNA work by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in, in blue and then, and then by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in green there. We can cover a lot of ground here um, uh, sampling water uh, in this way, but it's a tricky deal where we have to uh, be sure that, that those, those samples are sterile and not contaminated and that, and that they, they can help us. It's a new tool that's helping us uh, uh, identify the spots to look and in conjunction with our other traditional techniques gives us the, the, the approach that we can use to, to, to say that we're really doing a good job looking for that needle in the haystack that would be in a new invasive species. Um, we have set up along with, this, with these assessments important information sharing uh, 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 regimes and protocols that, that are connecting the, the, the pieces of the story together. We need to be able to respond if we find new organisms and those response plans have been developed domestically in each of the states, uh, uh, new response plans have put together in, in Canada. On, uh, um, uh, the province of Ontario and Fisheries and Oceans Canada put together a response plan for Asian carps all are based on incident command, the, the emergency uh, uh, system that we would put in place to respond to such an emergency. The uh, uh, Governors and Premiers Mutual Aid agree uh, uh, Committee have put together a, a, an important mutual aid agreement where the states and provinces uh, have joined efforts. We've taken efforts to, to try these things out through either tabletop exercise, that is sitting in a meeting room and trying out the exercise overall, or in the field, um, uh, noted in the middle, a large scale field program to look for grass carps in, in Western Lake Erie uh, involving all federal, state, and, and uh, provincial agencies. And in Illinois, an important effort around, around um, looking for uh, rough and grass carp. In Canada, in our detection efforts and through other efforts, we found a number of grass carp We've been able to put our full in, uh, um, response plans into place, working with the province to respond to those findings, and uh, have been successful in doing so. So we've learned how well our systems work uh, in responding, and in those cases, we've been able to capture uh, animals extensively and to, and to, as we believe, effectively remove them. Key to our actions and responses is the, uh, or the uh, is establishing new legislation and regulation for the basis for action. And in, uh, those new regulations have been, are, are central to those actions. In Canada, we have brand new national uh, AIS regulations under the Fisheries Act. In the United States, um, um, which came into place last April, in the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Service has new Lacey Act uh, listings for, of 11 species that are coming into place in, in, in the next uh, just few weeks. In Ontario, brand new invasive species legislation is, is coming into force in November. In Michigan, new listings under the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act are coming into play. And New York has also amended its regulations. Those regulations provide the basis for, for, for action uh, to deliver control and, and to prevent introductions. I mentioned that, that all our work is, has been working with others and we've been building on successful collaborations like the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's collaboration, which has been delivering sea lamprey control for many years. Central to our actions have been the work of the Great Lakes Commission and the Aquatic Nuisance Species uh, 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 Group, uh, which, has been, uh, which we've been working on closely. The Conference of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers AIS Task Force has been also of, of critical uh, of 
um, success in, in, in delivering the success as we mentioned. The Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee is central to uh, responding to Asian Carp overall. We're building and working with new collaboratives, including the Phragmites Collaborative, um, um, which, is a, which we mentioned earlier, which is a, a, have been a source of best practices overall, and the Evasive Muscle Collaborative. And we're looking at new opportunities, working under the Joint Strategic Plan. There's been important new science around uh, new de detection um, uh, techniques using uh, real-time eDNA, using sound um, and other uh, methods to block uh, organisms, looking for ways to deliver piscicides or, or, or compounds that could affect organisms directly, like micro-capitalization of piscicides to try to treat and, and control Asian carps. And we've been doing work in mesocosms, for example, the one year sent to the Canada Center for Inland Waters, looking at, at uh, uh, containment and disruption techniques. We've responded and connected with, with uh, climate change um, and, and tried to understand the effects on AIS. The Fish and Wildlife Service has established a new tool to do predictions there. And in this example, for example, the golden mussel, one of the least wanted species, uh, poses threats to the Great Lakes. And we can look at what would be the predictions of, of climate. And, and uh, in this case, we see an uh, increase in the overlap of, of uh, potential viable environments with the Great Lakes. Outreach and engagement of the public is central to the, to the efforts of the, of the annex. And, and there, as well, we've built on, on the great work of the Great Lakes Panel for Aquatic Nuisance Species. Its Information Education Committee has been doing a great job of exchanging the, the, that information. We're building on the, on the back of aquatic, Stop the Aquatic Hitchhikers efforts, other sea grant efforts like Habitatitude. In Ontario, the, um, the Invasive Species Awareness Program is a really critical uh, effort with leading to citizen science to help us uh, find and detect invasive species. And then we have a large scale uh, outreach program through the Invasive Species Center and an OFAH uh, to help us uh, educate people about invasive Asian carps. So let's look at that success. I showed this, this image earlier. We are on a trajectory towards increasing numbers of invasive species. But when we look at it today, um, we see in the last decade, there has not been a, a newly established invasive species in the Great Lakes. An amazing success. That success uh, bears uh, greatly on the, on the work of the Binational Ballast Water Exchange Regulation, the 100% monitoring program that Chris and Lauren will speak about in a few minutes. And of course, also on those efforts to protect the Great Lakes from Asian carps. So it's really an important story. But it doesn't end there, because we do still see some uh, invasive, like, like um, um, uh, water lettuce, mitten crabs, and others. So what's next for us? We have uh, a number of priorities, which include uh, moving on all the priorities and actions of the, of the group, including advancing our science uh, for tools for, for containment and eradication, design and passage around, around barriers, improving our tools for detection, we're looking at refining our, our, our early detection and rapid response initiative and to developing a clearinghouse for aquatic invasive species risk assessment so we can share that understanding. So th thank you very much. I, I hope that I've conveyed the message that we've made real progress and that we have much more to do. So thank you.